So those for those who you don't who don't know me, my name is Bill Browder. Um, I'm the author of a book called uh, Red Notice, um, a true story of, of, of high finance murder and one man's fight for justice. It's about my fight against Vladimir Putin after the murder of my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. Um, my book has, or my story has led to the passage of something called the Magnitsky Act, which is a piece of legislation which uh, Putin has made his major policy to try to overturn. And um, Brian and I met, I believe, uh, after Brian read my book, and maybe just, just to kind of get into our history a little bit, as, as I remember it, and, and maybe you can tell your version of the story, that, that you were in the midst of, of um, deciding which direction Icarus, your Academy Award-winning documentary, was going to go in, and whether you wanted to take on the Russian government for sports doping, and you had just been in the process of reading my book. You know, um, I, I, uh, uh, I had read your book um, early on. It was uh, as things started transpiring with uh, Gregory Rachenkov. Um, I kept hearing, oh, you got to read Red Notice. You got to read Red Notice. And uh, I picked it up and, and read it. And uh, clearly, it's a, a very frightening tale. And um, for whatever reason, um, uh, it didn't frighten me to not want to uh, continue to help uh, Gregory. And I think um, knowing that you um, were safe, you know, technically, and obviously you'd, you've encountered a lot of stuff with Interpol and their continued attacks on you, um, knowing that you were in London doing your work uh, alive um, certainly uh, kind of uh, gave me um, um, uh, solace in, um, in the continued battle and feeling like um, I wasn't the, I wasn't the only um, uh, uh, foreigner American <laughs> journalist who had found himself in the midst of the story rather than looking for the story. And uh, um, it was inspiring to see your work and made me want to continue what I was doing. Well, I, I was really um, flattered by that. And, and, and I was particularly flattered by that when you invited me to the um, premiere of Icarus in London. And when I, when I saw what you had done, what you had been able to do um, with a story. And I mean, it was, it, it was a documentary, but it really was more like a thriller. I mean, it was just, you know, it was all happening in real time. And, and, and I, I, I remember sitting in, in that uh, cinema and thinking to myself, this is the most unbelievable, dramatic story. And this is gonna win an Academy Award. And, I, and I'm not a movie expert or anything. And, um, but I just thought, how could it not? This is just so, so good. And I told you that afterwards. And so it really, I was really very um, flattered that my, my story and my book um, had given you some strength and inspiration to do your story, which as everyone who's watching this probably knows, um, led to you winning the Academy Award. So how did, how did you, um, actually, let me take a step back. You know, when, when I watched Icarus, you, you weren't a human rights activist. You weren't a, uh, you know, you, you were interested in, in biking and doping. Um, and and, and you, you kind of became a human rights activist and a justice activist through Icarus. H how did you end up um, with the, the story of Jamal Khashoggi and Mohammed bin Salman in, in Dissident? Where, where, where did that come from? Well, I, I think um, my activism um, probably very, very likely came from the same place uh, as your activism, meaning um, you, weren't, you weren't an activist at the time that you were working with Sergei Magnitsky. Um, it was only after he was murdered uh, and you saw that nobody else was going to fight for him and you believed that you could make change by fighting for Sergei Magnitsky that you went correct me if I'm wrong, from essentially being, you know, uh, 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 a hedge fund, um, you know, 
uh, financier uh, and investor to essentially being a human rights defender and your work transition from, you know, uh, operating a hedge fund to basically going all over the world seeking justice for Sergei Magnitsky because he was someone that you loved and someone that you cared for and saw the greater good in that. Um, you know, Icarus for me in bringing Rachenkov to the United States and then working with him and then seeing Russia try to hunt him and discredit him and continue to discredit him uh, and turn him into essentially the scapegoat and uh, the lone committer of this crime and deny the truth and deny uh, what happened all the while hunting him. Um, Whenever I've been in contact with, with Gregory, the conversation generally starts with, how are you, Brian? And I go, and I go, I'm good. How are you, Gregory? And he goes, I'm alive. And, and I said, well, that's good. And he goes, Brian, Brian. He's like, you're the hero of a decade. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, you saved my life. Yeah. And, um, and that for me, I don't take lightly and that, made me want to continue doing work like this. And so while the accolades came in for Icarus on the filmmaking level or on the story level, what was behind this was something very, very real. And a man's life who has been forever impacted, who lives in hiding on the run, um, who, you know, just the passage of the Rachenkov Anti-Doping Act or what just happened last week with the Court of Arbitration of Sport, you know, taking a four-year ban, turning into a two-year ban. Um, these are still uh, ongoing threads and Gregory's life is still in the balance. And so as I was looking to what my next film was going to be, I found through that process of making Icarus is I found myself an activist. I found myself a human rights defender. I found myself as someone who wanted to speak truth to power. I found myself as someone that enjoyed is not the word, but felt um, emboldened and empowered by trying to do something, to try to do those little things, to try to make the world a better place or for standing up for people that can't um, otherwise be stood up for um, because they don't have a voice. And it's interesting that you and I reconnected again with the dissident because of your work with the Human Rights Foundation and Thor Halverson, um, and that you two have, you know, have worked closely together over the last several years as your goals are aligned, and Thor Halverson and Gary Kasparov and, you know, um, and the Human Rights Foundation and your own Magnitsky Awards and their Vachel Havel Prize and, and the Oslo Freedom Forum, that it came full circle and here we are again, um, connected. Um, and, um, and so, you know, as the murder of Jamal happened uh, in those couple weeks in October, it, as the story unfolded, it checked all those boxes in my mind. Uh, uh, a Washington Post journalist who had been murdered essentially for speaking truth to power, who had been murdered for wanting his country to be a better place, had been murdered for, you know, trying to expose some of the corruption that was going on in his country, um, had been murdered for believing that uh, people should have a free opinion and a right to speak freely. And, um, and not only that, in MBS, there was that Putin-esque quality of a uh, authoritarian dictator with all the money in the world um, that believed that he could murder people on foreign so soil and get away with it. Uh, and just like in the story of uh, Magnitsky and Rachenkov, here we saw world leaders and world governments willing to look the other way because of the money, um, because of the size of a country, because to take action um, was so much more difficult than it was to just simply wash your hands of it and go away. And all of these elements um, combined to make me want to take on this story um, and go make a film about it. Um, and, and certainly um, even in the early days of making the film, 
the very first time I shot with Atija, if you probably remember this, it was, it was February of 2019. And Hatija had finally gave, granted me access. And I had met Hatija to speak at the European Parliament in Brussels. And you were there. And we ran into each other in like the commissary. And you yell out, Brian? And I turn around, I see you. I'm like, Bill, what are you doing here? You're like, well, I'm here, you know, speaking to Parliament on the, you know, Magnitsky sanctions. And I can't remember the country. I think it was Norway or what. It was one of the countries uh, that you're working was actually finally passing Magnitsky sanctions. And I was like, that's awesome. And so seeing you there as I was at the European Parliament with Hatija for the first time, I was like, all right, <laughs> there's, there's Bill. I'm on, I'm on the right path here. Uh, yeah, you just seems to be the intersection of our continual paths. Yeah, you definitely are. Yeah, you know, I, I, I followed the, the, this story, the um, uh, Jamal Khashoggi story was a real shocker. I mean, it, shocker for anyone. And, and for, for me, I, I was really enraged by that story. And, and, I, and I read everything there was to read about it as it was unfolding. And, um, but I have to say that watching your movie, it really did something for me, which no matter how much reading I could do, um, it really kind of brought it all into stark contrast. It was, you know, I've always believed that um, a good movie is, is more powerful in a justice campaign than just about anything else. And, and I, you know, if you look back in history of, you know, Midnight Express, you know, I believe that that's the reason yeah. why Turkey is not a member of the European Union, because like, how could you let a country like that into the, or, or the killing fields is the reason why, um, uh, um, you know, that there's a de the International Criminal Court for genocide or, or, um, uh, or Hotel Rwanda or, or, or even Blood Diamond. I mean, you know, good movie, but this one really, really moved me. And I'm somebody who was already moved. Um, and um, uh, my question for you is, is um, you've, you've shown it around now and, and I don't want to be bias anyone with my own sort of affection for you and my own, you know, since I'm all, but what has been the reaction to, to people who have seen your movie when, when you've shown it to them? Well, um, it's been, uh, it's been a, you know, kind of a, it's weird when you talk about um, in a story like this, incredible or wonderful because um, it's such a, a, a harrowing story, but, you know, the reaction, um, we premiered it at Sundance and Hillary Clinton was there and, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Alec Baldwin and Reed Hastings and a bunch, you know, and, and you know, it was um, standing ovations at every one of our screenings and people, you know, standing and she takes the stage, you know, wiping tears from her eyes. And uh, we had it in Zurich two months ago and, um it was a very, very similar reaction. And then even though the film is not out yet, you know, privately, um, various people that have seen it, um, a lot of really notable uh, politicians or celebrities or musicians, just people that can be of influence, um, you know, have seen it. And I've had just the most extraordinary emails written, uh, really of, of coming from a place of kindness or, um, uh, gratitude that this film was made. Um, so that's been great. And, you know, the critical reviews um, uh, so far have been wonderful. And, um, you know, and it's empowering because when you make something like this, and I know that like your work with Magnitsky, it becomes your life force, it becomes your energy. And ultimately, you're not just doing this work for Sergei Magnitsky, who is dead, you're doing the work for who could possibly be the next Sergei Magnitsky and the next Sergei Magnitsky and the next Sergei Magnitsky. And so the work that you're doing is looking into the future and holding the past as basically the barometer of what the future can be. And in this story, while Jamal is dead, you have Omar Abdelaziz who lives in Canada under the protection of Canada and self-exile. Uh, you have his brothers sitting in a jail for two years now, not charged with crimes, having been tortured, 
I mean, we, I was filming with Omer in, in real time as he's getting messages that his brother has had lost his teeth. Uh, there were other people very close to him and I didn't put this in the film because it was, he was worried for their lives and he showed me pictures of them being tortured that had been uh, sent to him. Uh, you know, 23 of his friends sit in jails without charges. Lujan al-Hatul, the Saudi woman's human rights activist, 31 years old. She spent the last two years without charges in a Saudi jail. She's now on trial. And the chief prosecutor of Saudi has asked for 20 years prison, the maximum sentence. Her crime is basically twofold. One, she suggested that women should be able to drive, but she suggested that before Mohammed bin Salman basically made that happen. Two, she suggested that women should not have to be forced to wear uh, full burqas where only their eyes are seen in the country, that women should be able to you know, uh, uh, show who they are. And three, she suggested that women should have a right to leave their home without the consent of an 18 year old male. For that, she is looking to spend 20 years of her life in a prison on top of the 800 beheadings that happened there last year. And so, you know, I made this film for, for these people in hopes that as the world sees the dissonant, they remind themselves that there is suffering going on on this level on our planet, that journalists can be cut up uh, without any accountability simply because, you know, you're worth trillions of dollars and control massive parts of the world's oil supply and have billions of dollars for investment uh, in tech companies, in media companies, in Hollywood. And because you're so rich, that somehow whitewashes um, the reality of your human rights abuses. And so when you get to know these people, just as you fell in love with your lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, it makes you want to fight for them. And that's what I'm hoping will be the takeaway from, from the dissonant. It's definitely, it, it's absolutely profound, the takeaway from the dissident. Um, so you won an Academy Award uh, for Icarus for Netflix. It was one of their very first Academy Awards. Um, so you, you, you're, 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 um, you're really, uh, they should really be, they're really proud of you, I'm sure, for the great work you did on Icarus. Um, and um, what happened uh, when you showed them The Dissident? This is um, a hard question because it's, it's a disappointing one. Um, you know, uh, I, I believed that um, my relationship, um, you know, with, with, with the company um, went beyond Icarus. We had shared so much success together um, and it went on such a journey together over that year from, you know, from their acquisition to essentially, um, you know, garnering the Oscar. Um, but there were really deeper relationships there. And um, uh, they made a decision not to acquire or distribute the film. And that was their decision to make. Um, I respect that decision. I don't take it personally. Um, but that decision was coming from, you know, uh, business. And when you look at what is happening uh, in, in our world right now, is the globalization of these companies. And there was, a, you know, there was an article I think three days ago in the New York Times talking just about this among all the media companies, that um, there is a willingness to look the other way uh, for hum of what is going on in human rights abuses, whether it's China or whether it's Saudi Arabia or even fear at it from North Korea you know, in the Sony hack, et cetera, um, that anything that doesn't align with the global growth, subscriber growth, growing in a region, taking investment from a region, being able to have, uh, um, you know, money coming from that part of the region, um, 
uh, that these companies are showing themselves more and more willing to look the other way um, and either refuse to distribute content such as this, or like in the case of Hassan Minhaj, um, they pulled you know, the Patriot Act, uh, uh, the episode they did on MBS off of Saudi Arabia, essentially because they were asked by the kingdom to do so. And in subsequent it, it, uh, you know, interviews, um, there's been direct comments going, hey, we're, we're not a truth to power company, we're an entertainment company. And, and, I, re and I respect that. And I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, mad, I'm not mad at them, but um, it is, it's disheartening for, for me, it's disheartening for you. It's disheartening for every other storyteller that wants to bring stories like this to the world, because we do these things because we believe that, okay, maybe we can make the world a better place. Or maybe if their 200 million subscribers understand this story, they're going to fight for Lujan al Hatul. They're going to fight for Omar Abdulaziz's brothers. And that pressure from the global community will bring about change. And that's what we saw with Icarus, which was so powerful. You would follow that story. You know that story. But when Icarus came out in August 2017, despite everything, Russia was still going to the Olympics. And five months later, the IOC and their reasoned decision for banning Russia from the 2018 Pyeongchang Games cited Icarus and, and so you go, wait, a film was able to make true real world change because it had a platform such as Netflix to do that, that people all over the world could come and easily see this content. And the case of a dissonant, that will not be the case. People will need to go see the film on video on demand uh, or in a limited theater, but most likely on video on demand through iTunes or Amazon and rent the film because we don't have a global streamer. It was not just Netflix, it was, it was all of them. Um, making a, a conscious decision that despite the accolades, despite um, the, you know, the critical reviews, et cetera, that this didn't align um, you know, with, with their business interests or shareholder value or accountability. And, um, and much like you've done with you know, your work with the um, Magnitsky Act, um, maybe that's the next step um, of of changing uh, those policies, um, that there is accountability. Brian, you're, you're, you're more generous than me. I, I don't respect them for that decision. I'm, I'm, uh, you won an Academy Award for Netflix. The, the producers, and I know, I know your co-producers on this thing, I know uh, the Human Rights Foundation, I know Thora Halverson, they didn't invest in this to make money. They invested in this because you're a brilliant filmmaker, and this is a shocking story that needed to be told. And I would imagine that there was very, almost zero financial risk in acquiring this from a, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm sure they weren't putting a huge price tag on it in order to, uh, to get Netflix to put, put this out there. This was a, a social project. This was a humanitarian project. And the fact that, that you won them an Academy Award and that you had standing ovations at Sundance um, and that every single person who's seen this movie has been moved by it, that this movie will have the same effect that Icarus ha has had. Um, you know, it really is, is almost, I think they're, they're sort of um, uh, abrogating their responsibility. They, they have a responsibility to, um, to show this and they're, and they're not showing it. And, um, and, and I don't wanna single out Netflix, Amazon, it, it, uh, Jeff Bezos is in your movie. Uh, uh, um, Jamal Khashoggi worked for the Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos. And you know, when my employee, Sergei Magnitsky was killed, I gave up my life as a hedge fund manager and risked my life to go out and get justice for him. And Jeff Bezos can't even put this on Amazon. I mean, I just don't get it. And um, sorry to rant here, but but um, I, I think everybody should know this, that, that um, uh, you know, you, you, you're being polite about it, that there's no reason to be polite about it. This is an extraordinary movie where, where the Hollywood establishment, the main distributors, um, are blocking it 
why are they blocking it? Let's let's call a spade a spade. You know, they're either wanting to get money from the Saudis. Um, they're afraid of of uh, being hacked by the Saudis. Um, and they're they're sitting there, and and there's a lot of crap on on all these streaming services, which don't come anywhere near your the dissident, and um, and they're holding it back. And so I, I think that 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 there is a um, a moral imperative, actually, for for the people who are um, thinking about awards to to <laughs> to give this movie some recognition. Uh, not just because it's a great movie, but because it's it's an important movie that needs to be known about, um, and and the need, and if it's gonna if you're gonna have to bypass the uh, Hollywood establishment, um, the world should recognize this through 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 other means. And I and I would hope that they're all after you win the Academy Award for this one, they're all begging you to stream it afterwards. Um, uh, anyways, enough of my rant, <laughs> but I had to say it, and and it's really important. It's been it's been. Um... It's been a, a wake up call um, as a, you know, everything that what you just said. And, um, you know, and knowing that this is not about whether or not tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people would watch this film and have that visceral reaction or want to take action, but that instead um, this film is not being distributed on a major uh, global platform um, because of the business interests and the fear rather than standing up um, and having accountability and being um, someone like you or someone like me that wants to tell these stories. And, um, and you know, I think we we want to believe, at least I want to believe that the more money uh, and the more success and the more power you might hold in the world, if you're on the side of good, that you want to keep fighting for those things. And what we see is that business uh, and greed um, and all these other factors um, get in the way of that. I mean, the same thing has happened with China. And when you talk about Thor Halverson, the Human Rights Foundation, um, they put the money up, believing that this money was going to come back to the foundation, which is now not going to, um, to help other human rights cases, help other human rights uh, abuses. Um, and also, there was never a financial equation for them. So, like, at the end of the day, I mean, there were, there were films at Sundance, there was a, a doc this year that sold for $12 million dollars. Uh, about 17 year old boys who go to Texas to play uh, mock politics. $12 million. And had we been offered $100,000 by a major streamer, Human Rights Foundation would have taken it. This was not about money. There was no offer, none, not for a dollar not for $10,000, not for $12 million. And, um, and, that's, and that's difficult, um, but you know, the film is gonna make its way out there. We have a distributor in the UK, Altitude, that's uh, wonderful. And you know, when we get through COVID and you know, all of our international distribution plans now are, you know, we're theatrical and, and, uh, and Briar Cliff, Mortimer in the U.S. Uh, took this film on after we didn't have a sale at Sundance. And, you know, we're, uh, we had a plan to go into a lot of theaters, which is now a handful of theaters, but it will be on video on demand January, January 8th. And the hope is, is that people will find the film. And then the hope is, is that after that, um, you know, that one of these uh, streamers will pick it up for the, you know, for the streaming SVOD window uh, when it's not one of their originals, um, so that the film will live on and have a platform to be on. And I'm, and I'm still optimistic about that. I do hope um, that when that risk of branding in an original is out of the way, and now it's, you know, uh, just another piece of content on the platform, that this film will be there 
uh, because it's certainly not about money. It's, uh, it's about access to the film. So I, I just wanna finish up by talking about the real world um, significance of what you have done. And, um, you know, coming back to the whole idea of the killing fields and Hotel Rwanda and Midnight Express, your movie Icarus um, put Russia in the dock on sports doping in a real way. And um, the, the people, the, in Washington, there's now a piece of legislation called the Rodchenkov Act, which uh, basically illegalizes and causes harsh sanctions and consequences for Russia and other countries in the future who are involved in sports doping. Um, named after your, the main subject of your film, that's real. I mean, and you know, laws don't get passed very often. You got what, because of what you did, it got it passed. You saved his life and you've put Putin um, in a very unpleasant situation where the world discovered that, that, that basically he was such a narrow-minded, low-level guy that he was ready to cheat in sports to try to elevate his own esteem. Dramatic. This movie, The Dissident, will have the same impact. Uh, Donald Trump bragged about protecting Mohammed bin Salman. There, are, there is a movement to, to impose Magnitsky sanctions on Mohammed bin Salman and the people who killed Jamal Khashoggi. They placed those sanctions on the people, on the operatives, but Trump blocked Mohammed bin Salman. There's a new government coming in, Biden administration. And I believe that if this movie is popular and seen, it will have the impact of, of real justice, which will be the US uh, taking action against Mohammed bin Salman. And so I, I really um, hope that the censorship, and, and that's, that there's no other way to describe it, it's the censorship of Hollywood um, won't block this movie from, from being viral um, in whatever way it can be. And I hope that the people who are watching this interview today will you know, make it their business as well to watch the movie, get, get, have the reaction that I've had and get behind it in whatever way they can so that, um, that we, we are jointly able to overcome this um, blockade, which is, is really an injustice in my mind. Look, you know, uh, I, uh, um, I, I, I want, like, I don't view this film as a film by Brian Fogel or um, like in that, in that regard. And I think this, hopefully the support of this film, and that is something that, um, that the accolades that Icarus received, like had, had I not won the Oscar for Icarus, I could have never made The Dissident because that opened the doors for me to Hatizia, to Omar, to the Turkish government, to that access. Because now I was not just Brian Fogel, I was Academy Award winner Brian Fogel. And that, as silly as that sounds, that allowed these people that were going through this grief to go, okay, I, I'll trust my story to you and I'll tell that. And that is, you know, the, the hope that I do have for this film is that um, those kind of accolades can really help the world to see it um, so that it doesn't get lost. Because if it has that moniker, my hope is that despite whatever else has happened, that it will continue to live on. It'll, it'll end us up on a streaming platform. In because um, it's been, you know, uh, uh, given that validation. And so for me, um, as an activist, as a human rights defender, as someone who made this film for Khatija Jengas and Omar Abdelaziz and Lujana Hatul and Jamal Khashoggi and all of those uh, Saudi human rights defenders that sit in jails, um, that the power of this film, I know, is that if people see it, that whether it's in six months from now or whether it's in a year from now or however long it takes um, that it can bring about real change and impact. And if nothing else, it makes you sit there and go, okay, I learned something and I'm a little bit smarter. I'm a little bit more enlightened. And next time, you know, 
I go fill up my gas tank or um, I read about this investment or I see Mohammed bin Salman walking around in a suit meeting with Bill Gates, I think differently. Or when I turn on my phone, I worry about all this cybersecurity and hacking software the governments have access to. And while each of us as an individual might not truly be able to do something about it, um, that knowledge is power. In the case of you, you took something that seemed to be insurmountable and turned it into a global cause and have caused you know, huge financial damage and replications for Putin's Russia. And, uh, you know, and maybe the dissident can do the same uh, in regards to Mohammed bin Salman and Saudi Arabia. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it will. I hope it comes quicker and easier. Um, and um, and I um, really uh, applaud you, admire what you've done and, and um, support you. So you, God Bill. bless you. And, and I hope that, um, that when we're talking uh, a year from now, after you've won the Academy Award for this one, um, you know, we, we, can, uh, we can laugh at the, uh, at the challenges of, of trying to tell the truth. Well, what I, what I hope is that I'll, uh, in a year from now, I'll be running back into you uh, somewhere in Washington or uh, the European Parliament. And uh, I'll be saying, hey, Bill, guess what I'm working on? <laughs> and um, we'll be with uh, Thor Halverson and you and I, uh, uh, what's been great over the last few years has been so many things that we've both been invited to speak to and uh, uh, speak at. And, um, you know, it's an honor to just have you as a friend because uh, the work that you're doing has had huge impact in the world and, uh, and you keep doing it and you keep taking those risks and uh, bravo. Same, same back to you. Yeah, thanks, Bill.